here now. And then this last summer, uh, we organized the Berkeley Seminar and following that, we started working towards Galois theory. And we're currently working towards the Abu Rufini theorem. So let me summarize what the group at Imperial did. Uh, so this was a few years ago and it was mostly undergraduates, but a lot of it was done by kind of, Kenny Lau did a lot of it. And a lot of the kind of basic algebraic structures uh, in Lean, if you've done some work in the algebra part of the library, a lot of them were done by um, this group and particularly Kenny. Uh, so like algebras and sub-algebras in particular, but also some other things. And There are also some important constructions like splitting fields and algebraic closures that, uh, that were defined by this group. And these were very helpful when we were proving Galois theory. And there are also a few key theorems that I'll get to in the next slide. But here are some of the uh, constructions that they made. It's kind of an inductive definition of the splitting field and also the algebraic closure. And in terms of key theorems, um, there are a few theorems proved by Kenny that were particularly useful for the Galois correspondence. There were these first two uh, kind of numerical facts relating degrees of field extensions to cardinalities of groups. And then there was this third theorem uh, that we used when proving the equivalence of conditions of Galois extensions that uh, kind of tells you when certain field extensions are Galois. And here's some of the statements from Lee. These came, a file, came from a file called fix.lean. Okay, now the Berkeley Lean seminar, uh, this was just this last summer. It was organized by myself, Patrick, Patrick Lutz and uh, Rahul Dalal. And at the time we didn't really know much about lean. Um, we were kind of all learning it together. And we started off going through the natural number game and then Patrick Mousseau's exercises. And then we went on to small independent projects. Uh, the, Attendance did drop off a bit, uh, and there are a few places where we lost people, and it might be helpful if you're doing one of these yourself to say what those were. So kind of there were some technological troubles that we lost people at, and also moving on beyond the natural number game was a bit of a hurdle for some people. And finally, uh, the last exercise of the Patrick Musso tutorial, I think uh, we lost a few people there. Which one is exercise 80? I, it might, I think it's the last one. It might be the, uh, the me, in, uh, the intermediate value theorem, maybe? Yeah, I think it, that sounds right. I mean, that's yeah. the final boss of the, of the game. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's the final boss. And uh, I think some, some people tried uh, valiantly to, to fight it without success. Yeah. Yeah, some of the small projects that people did um, were the De Bruyne Erdős theorem from graph theory, uh, the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem, and the Chinese remainder theorem in number theory. And it, after the seminar was over, a few of us decided to kind of continue working on Galois theory. Uh, and we would be, if you want to kind of hear more about what our experience was, we'd be happy to discuss more about this uh, later. So, in terms of Galois theory, uh, the first thing we did was just defining adjoining elements to fields. And the reason for this was that our first big project was proving the primitive element theorem, which states that if your extension, field extension is finite and separable, then there's a single element you can adjoin to kind of reach the top right away. You don't need to adjoin multiple. And following that, we proved the Galois correspondence, which is a uh, bijection between intermediate fields and subgroups. And then we also proved this standard list of Kind of equivalent conditions of Galois in the form of a kind of a when it leans kind of the following are equivalent. Uh, we should mention all this has been done before. Uh, there's this, well, it's been, in particular, it's been done in Cock. So, like, here's the code in Cock for the fact that the splitting field is Galois. Uh, this is all in Cock's math comp. And the reason why it's there is because uh, this sort of thing was needed for the project in formalizing the odd order theorem. And this includes basically everything we've done. So the primitive element theorem, the Galois correspondence and a few other things. Uh, now I wanted to kind of say a few things about some of the things we found interesting. So one of the, one of the first things we did, as I said, was kind of defining adjoining elements to fields. 
And initially we did this in terms of the subalgebra type, um, saying that kind of if you join an element or a set to F, you end up with an F subalgebra of E. Uh, but that's not really the right way to think about it. Really, it should be an intermediate field. Uh, that wasn't, this type didn't exist when we started, but thankfully on uh defined this type and it was very helpful for us. And when it was initially defined, it was kind of a new type and not much was proved about it. There was a partial ordering on it, but we didn't know many things about the partial order like that you could take intersections or that you could take compositums. And it seemed like we'd have to do a lot of work proving lots of little lemmas about these operations. But one thing that really surprised us is that this uh, notion of adjoining elements to fields actually allowed us to get a lot of these facts about the partial order for free. And the key fact that I'll expand upon is that there's this thing called a Galois insertion uh, and the adjoining map and the coercion backwards uh, form, what it, form one of these Galois insertions. And that allows you to get a lattice structure for free. So dwelling on that a little more, uh, first, um, just to be precise, so if you've got a field extension and you've got a subset of the top, then you can kind of adjoin those elements to the bottom and look at kind of the smallest subfield of E containing the base field and also that new set. And the Scalar insertion, uh, this is an order theoretic notion. It's a pair of order preserving functions between two partial orders, such that it has this symmetric Galois connection property. And it also has this asymmetric property that kind of one's a left inverse of the other. And so this, so this is an asymmetric notion. It's a Galois insertion of Q into P. And the big theorem that really surprised us from MATLAB was that if you do have one of these Galois insertions, then you can kind of pull back a complete lattice structure. If you've got a Galois insertion of intermediate fields into sets, then you can pull back a complete lattice structure on sets and get a complete lattice structure on intermediate fields. And so a little more, uh, so the adjoining kind of adjoining elements to fields you can think about as a function that takes in a set and uh, gives you an intermediate field. And yeah, so this is, a, this is a particular case of adjoint functors, although I think the Galois connection is really saying it's an adjoint functor and this kind of composition thing, I'm not sure how you would state that in func... Well, I mean, you can easily state it in functorial language, but it, the Galois insertion is a little more than just a pair of adjoint functors. Uh, so yeah, so adjoining you can think of as a function or even like, um, a functor from sets to intermediate fields. And there's this definition, there's this coercion map in the opposite direction. If you're having an intermediate field, you can just view it as a subset of E. And the kind of, the at least the Galois connection part is this lemma here. It states that adjoining is less than or equal to some fixed intermediate field, if and only if the set is less than or equal to that intermediate field. And secretly, there's a coercion here. Uh, this T has to get turned from an intermediate field to a set. And that's why this is actually the kind of Galois, and Galois connection property from before. So if you prove this short little lemma, along with the uh, second condition, uh, you can get a Galois insertion, and then you get the complete lattice structure for free. So I think this is all done in like 15 lines at the start of the adjoin file. It's a really, really quick way to get the intermediate field struct or to get the lattice structure on intermediate fields. And we just found this really spectacular that you could do all this and get kind of things like composite of intermediate fields without doing hardly any work at all. And we would have had to do this work anyway because we were defining adjoining elements. Okay, and then the other kind of big thing we did with intermediate, with kind of adjoining and intermediate fields is uh, related to induction. So oftentimes uh, when you want to prove a fact about a field extension, you kind of want to induct your way up. And there's kind of two common ways to do this. You either kind of use like the degree as your numerical invariant and induct on the degree, or you kind of induct along a sequence of generators. You pick a sequence of generators and kind of adjoin one element at a time and build your way up that way. And we found that both of these were not super easy to use in formalization. Induction on the degree was a bit painful because you had to kind of quantify over field extensions and picking generators was a bit nasty as well. So our solution was just, we've got this custom type of intermediate fields. Why don't we define a custom induction scheme? And we just prove this little lemma, uh, which states that if you want to prove a fact about 
adjoining a finite set of elements, you can just adjoin them one at a time. If you know that the property holds of the base, and if it holds of adjoining a single element of the set, then it also holds of adjoining the whole set. And occasionally, there's also kind of special versions of this that you might also want. So this is a version where you don't have a specific set you're adjoining, you just assume it's finite dimensional and that adjoining an element preserves the property. And this induction scheme turned out to be really useful. We used it a few times during the uh, project and yeah, it, it just it was very convenient to use. Uh, and lastly, I wanna give a bit of an overview of kind of the interesting things that went into our proof of the Galois correspondence. Uh, so we took a kind of unusual route, route to proving the Galois correspondence uh, we use the primitive element theorem. And uh, so a primitive the primitive elements theorem says that if your field extension is finite and separable, then there's kind of a single element you can adjoin to reach the top. You don't have to pick a sequence. And the Galois correspondence uh, states that there's this order reversing bijection between intermediate fields and subgroups. And even if you don't know anything about the Galois correspondence, what you notice is that the two maps that are defined are actually defined in general. It's just, they're only gonna be a bijection in the case of a Galois extension. So you already have your hands on what the bijection should be. You just have to prove that kind of, kind of that they're inverses to each other. And it turns out that you really only need to know kind of two numerical facts in order to prove this. Uh, one relating kind of the, well actually both of them relating kind of the degree of an extension to the order of a subgroup. And these two numerical facts, once you prove them, the Galois correspondence actually follows really quickly. So this first fact was proved by Kenny Lau. It's a sort of kind of, I think the keyword is linear independence of automorphisms. And the second fact is where we use the primitive element theorem. Uh, I won't go into the details. They're in the slides if you want to read them. But basically, you pick, an, you pick a primitive element and show that both sides of this are equal to the degree of the minimal polynomial of the primitive element. And I think that makes the proof kind of easier than it often is. So that's how we prove the Galois correspondence and it's a bit different from what usually happens. And kind of moving on, so once we prove the Galois correspondence, kind of we wanted to move on towards the Abu Rufini theorem. So um, you might know from school that there's a quadratic formula, there's also a cubic formula and a quartic formula. The Abu Rufini theorem says that there's no quintic formula, uh, that it stops right there. And this is really surprising. Uh, why would the pattern stop there? And this is actually one of the remaining problems on Freak's list. Uh, Freak has this list of 100 unsolved problems, 100 problems to formalize, and it's one of the five remaining problems. So it states that you can't kind of write this in polynomials of degree at least five, where you can't write down the roots using only radicals and field operations. Uh, oh, Freak, okay. Sorry. Uh, so you can prove this using Galois theory. The five remaining problems on the list. It is one of the, it's not entirely clear why it hasn't been done yet because it's one of the kind of, it's one of the more algebraic problems and it's not for Maslow's theorem. Uh, the remaining problems are more analytic or really hard. Uh, we should mention there's also a project underway to formalize it in Cock as well. And uh, I'll finish off my portion of the talk with kind of the main idea. So the main idea is that, so you wanna show that there is a number which is not solvable by radicals. And the idea is that, okay, suppose you had a number that was solvable by radicals, what can you say? The idea is that you can adjoin one radical at a time and get some tower of fields. So here's a kind of a concrete example. You've got some number that's solvable by radicals. You can get a sort of tower of fields and this tower allows you to kind of induct your way up or induct your way down and show that the Galois group is what is called solvable. Um, that is kind of built out of abelian extensions. And that allows you to conclude something about the element you had to start with. And to expand on this a little more, um, there are a few caveats. So one thing is that the top field needs to be Galois, which makes it a little tricky. You can't just kind of naively join the radicals you see. And also when proving that the top field is solvable over the base, the induction is a little tricky. You can't really induct your way up. You kind of have to like, build your way up or kind of build, build your way down, um, which is a little tricky and we'll actually try to bypass that. And kind of the proof sketch is that you use this idea from the previous slide that if an element was solvable by radicals, then its group is solvable. You find, and then you just find kind of a number explicitly where the Galois group is not solvable. And that proves that there, that particular 
complex number has Galois group that is what well, proves that that particular complex number is not solvable by radicals. So it's kind of a weird approach, but that's how the Avogadro theorem is proved. And I think Patrick will take over from here. I think there is a question from Cyril first. Oh. Oh, what what looked wrong? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you come back two slides? I mean, the, the slide before the last. Yeah, uh, hold up. Something's, something went wrong on my computer. Let me. Is it here? Uh, just one before. Uh -huh. it's, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Never mind. Yeah, I mean, there, is, there are some details being glossed over here. But. Yeah, I mean, the, the Galois group stays solvable if the extension is Galois, and it's not always the case. So yeah, that's right, yeah. We, we need to, okay. I've been through all of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thinking, yeah. So. so that's sort of the, the caveat on the next slide. And even if you just are drawing roots of unity ahead of time, I think you still run into some problems. So. Uh, no, if you are the roots of unity, it, it's fine. Uh, but it, it's uh, when you don't and you cannot, uh, I mean, okay, yes, even if you add roots of unity, uh, you, you, you can run into problems, you're right. Yeah. But uh, it just depends on how you define the solvable extension actually. Right. right. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess I started one slide too early. Okay, so um, next I'm going to talk about a little bit just about our plan for um, proving this and what we've done so far. And uh, by the way, uh, how much time is left in the talk? Uh, you've got until 15 or yeah, 15 past. Uh, thanks. So, um, okay, here's sort of the, the idea of the plan. Um, so I guess the first thing is to define solvable by radicals. Uh, and, um, okay, what does this literally mean in normal mathematics? It's, you know, uh, if you have a field extension, an element is solvable by radicals, if you can write it in terms of some formula with elements of F, uh, field operations and taking radicals. Um, and it's very naturally looks like an inductive type with constructors corresponding to each one of those things. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this later. Um, okay. Uh, next, you want to have the definition of solvable groups and some facts about them. Um, so um, there's a few different definitions of solvable groups. I guess the most standard one is sort of that they can be built out of uh, tower of abelian extensions, as Thomas said. Um, we define them in a slightly different way. It's not super hard to see their equivalent. So we define it in terms of the derived series of the group. Um, so if you have a subgroup of a group, um, you can look at the group of commentators of elements of that group. Um, and that's gonna be a normal subgroup of G. Uh, well, if, if H is normal, it's going to be a normal subgroup of G. And so the derived series is you just start with G and you just iterate this operation. Um, and uh, a group is solvable if, if you eventually hit the trivial subgroup um, after a finite number of steps. Okay, and we need, to, we need to define solvable groups and prove various facts about them. Um, like, and each of these facts more or less corresponds to, you know, some things we need when we're, when we're looking at field extensions. Um, so the, the way we sort of propagate the property of the Gawa group being solvable corresponds to different lemmas we'll need about solvable groups. Um, uh, we also want to define the Galois group of an algebraic element. Um, actually, this is mostly just already done by uh, some work of Kenny and, and some things, with, uh, some properties from the Galois theory project. 
Uh, so here, here's basically the definition uh, that will maybe eventually be in uh, MathLib. It's just uh, the group of automorphisms of the splitting field of the minimal polynomial of the element. Um, and we have splitting field and minimal polynomial and so on, thanks to previous work of Kenny and uh, some other people. Um, so uh, next, I mean, we put these together and this is really the core of the proof is to show that uh, an element is solvable by radicals, then it uh, has a solvable Galois group. Um, and I'll also say a little bit more about this later, but uh, the idea is to do induction on the, the solvable by radicals type. And the sort of hard part, like the really, the part where all the real sort of mathematical content is, is the case where um, you're dealing with radicals, you're joining a, a radical. And the key lemma that makes it work is that if the bottom field has all the nth roots of unity, and if A is in, well, if A is some element of the bottom field, then uh, the nth root of A has a Belian Galois group over F. Um, and, uh, okay, in practice, this F will really be some intermediate field of E over F. Um, okay, uh, and then to actually get an element with that's not solvable by radicals, we want to know that there's some group that's not solvable. Uh, so S5 is a sort of standard choice. Um, one way that to see this is to prove that A5 is simple. Um, actually, there's sort of a <laughs> kind of funny, very easy direct proof of this that I'll, I'll say later if there's time. Um, maybe proving A5 is simple is sort of the right way to do it, but um, it's not the easiest way. Uh, and then next, we'll want to actually get a polynomial with Galois group S5. Uh, so first, we need some facts about uh, about when you actually, when you have a subgroup of Sn, when is it? The entire SN. Um, and the, at least the way we plan on doing it is, um, we're doing it is that if you have a, a prime and you have, a, you're looking at SP, if you have a P cycle and a transmission, then together they give you everything in SP. And uh, one way to prove this is you sort of rotate the cycle around until the transmission is swapping two things that are next to each other in the cycle. And then you can just prove sort of a series of lemmas about, about uh, symmetric groups. So if you have a cycle and adjacent transposition, you can do some induction to get all the adjacent transpositions, assuming you have maybe some linear order on the group, maybe coming from the cycle. Um, and then uh, you can get all the transpositions and then you can get the entire symmetric group. Um, okay, and then to use that, we need a, there to be a polynomial with Galois group S5. Um, so, and this is what I just said is part of the proof that there is one. So here's an example, uh, the, this polynomial x to the fifth minus six x plus three has three real roots and two uh, conjugate complex roots. Um, so here's a picture of its roots and complex conjugation gives us the transposition. And then, uh, okay, the it's less obvious maybe, um, you know, on first glance that there should be a five cycle, but um, it just follows from the fact that this is an irreducible polynomial of degree five and so on. So, um, uh, okay, so you can just pretty concretely get transposition on a five cycle. And uh, then you know that you pick up the entire group S5. Uh, okay, and then um, once we have all these things, we can combine them to get the Abel Ruffini theorem. It's a pretty direct consequence of this. So there's a polynomial with Galois group S5. It's not solvable. So none of the roots of that um, polynomial can be solvable by radicals. Okay, so what's the current status of all this? Well, I guess the first thing to say is we've done all the easy parts um, and uh, we're sort of working on all the hard parts and uh, we haven't finished yet. So um, the ones in green are basically just totally done. The ones in orange were at some level of completion. And of course, the, the main part of the proof is really the, the circle in the middle, solvable by radicals implies solvable Galois group. And uh, well, we're sort of in the middle of that. So 
the others that um you know are are reasonably close to being done or something um okay so uh now let me say a few things just about a, a couple of parts of this that are interesting um so our sort of route to uh to proving that thing about solved by radicals implies solvable Galois group well they said solved by radicals naturally looks like an inductive type um so here it is in lean and uh i guess one benefit of this is it's sort of very transparently i think capturing what it should mean for an element to have you know be have a formula involving radicals um so there's just different cases. You can take something in the base field. You can add together two things that are solved by radicals. You can multiply them. You can take radicals of them. Um, and it's also nice that, it, uh, as we'll see, it gives you automatically an induction scheme. Um, so we chose to uh, bundle this actually into an intermediate field. So we define the intermediate field of um, things that are solved by radicals. This is sort of nice because then you can uh, use the sort of intermediate field interface. Um, so we can talk about adjoining solved by radical elements and so on, and know that everything we get is uh, solved by radicals, that sort of thing. Um, okay, and then we also get sort of for free an induction scheme just coming from the inductive type. Uh, so here's what it looks like, you know, if you can, um, you know, show that if you have a property and it holds of everything in the base field and it holds if it holds of two things and it holds when you add them together or multiply or whatever. And also if it holds when you take radicals, then it holds of everything in the SBR type or in the SBR intermediate field in this case. Um, and then how, how are we gonna put this to work? Well, so in the standard proof of the Abel Ruffini theorem, you sort of form this tower of radical extensions, but as, okay, as Cyril, uh, Cyril pointed out, there's this sort of issue that um, if you do this too naively, you don't even end up with something Galois. And in any case, the intermediate fields in this tower are typically, I mean, not guaranteed to be Galois, even if you already have all the nth roots of unity and so on. Um, if you just adjoin a radical, uh, you don't necessarily, you end up with something Galois over the previous field, but not necessarily Galois over the base field. Um, and then you, so the standard strategy sort of is to take this tower of extensions, like take its Galois closure, show that you still have a tower of radical extensions and then sort of work backwards showing that the top field is has solvable Galois group over each intermediate field, starting with the, the biggest one and going down. Um, but this is sort of annoying uh, to formalize. So um, we took a somewhat different route, which is doing induction directly on the solved by radicals type. And the property what, that we're inducting on is that the splitting field of the minimal polynomial has solvable Galois group. So you might just say, I guess, that the an element is SBR, then it has solvable Galois group. We're just inducting literally on that. And we still need to do this sort of a little bit tricky thing, um, well, somewhat tricky thing for the case of a radical extension, but it's sort of more isolated. We don't have to deal with, um, you know, the standard proof is to sort of just take one giant tower. We don't have to deal with that. We could just um, look directly in the case where it matters. Um, so here's sort of the uh, <laughs> um, the theorem we'd like to prove. And uh, okay, you can see there's the the property we're inducting on written in lean. Uh, the as I said, the Galois group of the minimal polynomial is solvable. And okay, first we had to do some induction to show that every solved by radicals element is algebraic, but that part's not so hard. Um, Okay, the last thing I want to. Uh, well, Wait, the, the, can you oh, show yeah. the previous slide? So, so what is yes. is integral alpha you meant to write a term whose type is in is integral alpha? Yeah, so this is uh, I guess shorthand. I hoped nobody uh, we hoped nobody would sort of question, but it, I mean, so what what happened is we proved a theorem called is integral, assuming that an element is is in the intermediate field SBR. Oh, okay, 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 okay. yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that's a proof. It's just not a very, it's not a, a nearly as hard of a proof as this. Um, so I didn't mention it. Uh, okay, yeah. So then the last sort of mathematical thing I want to talk about just briefly is, just because it's sort of fun, uh, is the idea we have for showing S5 is not solvable. So, okay, solvable means the derived series is eventually trivial. 
here's the definition of derived series. Um, one thing to note about this, it's sort of not very hard to see, but um, the derived series is always giving you normal subgroups. Um, so we want to show that S5, the derived series of S5 never hits the trivial subgroup. It's actually enough to just show there's some element that always stays in it. And well, why not just the three cycle one, two, three? Um, so the induction is just if you contain one, two, three and you're normal, you can conjugate to get these two other three cycles. And the commutator of those two, three cycles is one, two, three. So one, two, three is always in the derived series and it never, never hits the trivial subgroup. How um, do you know you can get one, four, three? Uh, you just conjugate. Uh, so oh, you of know course, that, of course, yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, so that's why I said that it's uh, always normal. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, that's that's the proof. It's a lot easier than showing A5 is uh, simple. Uh, maybe it's um, it's would be good to eventually have uh, A5 is simple in MATLAB. And I think somebody on Zulip once mentioned that maybe Chris Hughes has proved that at some point, but uh, for now, uh, we just use this proof because it's very easy to implement. Um, okay, and then the last thing, uh, well, what are some uh, things you could do after Abel Ruffini? Uh, so one thing is, um, well, we have field theory, we have a little bit of Galois theory, maybe you don't need that much Galois theory for this. Uh, you could define constructible numbers and prove some things about compass and straight edge constructions. and. This At least one motivation. Oh, yeah. It's much easier than uh, Belo Fini. Yeah, probably so. Uh, but it's still nice to have, I suppose. Yeah, um, it would be great. Eh? I, I wanted to ask this question at the end of the talk. <laughs> um, we don't have very concrete plans, but uh, it's we're aware of it. Um, and one, one motivation is, uh, well, here's some uh, theorems from Frake's list that are missing from MathLib. And uh, number eight, as you can see, is, well, number eight on Frake's list, not number eight of the ones that are missing, is the impossibility of trisecting the angle. And well, that's something that seems very doable right now. Um, and another thing is, uh, well, we have Galois groups and so on. So we could talk about the Galois groups of number fields. And OK, I know very little about algebraic number theory, but I've been told they're important. So. Um, OK, so that's uh, sort of some possible things next. And uh, that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I've got a quick question. <clears throat> um, you mentioned this uh, this intermediate field you defined of all the construct uh, all the solvable by radical elements. <clears throat> Did you happen to formalize anything about the structure of its Galois group in the Galois case? Um, so the I guess the only thing we're actually working on right now with that is just showing that the Galois group is always solvable. Uh, nothing more. Right. Okay. Complicated. Although it's I mean, I guess, you have to be. It's, it's infinite in some cases, like it, because the way it's constructed is you start with a, a field extension and then we've defined the solvable by radical elements inside that. So if you just start with like all the solvable by radical elements inside C over Q, you're going to get some big infinite thing. I understand, but if, if you start with uh, if your original extension is say finite Galois, mm. then I, I guess the statement I have in mind is that the Galois group, the subgroup of the Galois group corresponds to the intersection of all the terms in the derived series or something like this. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, maybe make one more comment. Um, I don't know about these, uh, this list of 100 theorems, but I think a very interesting theorem to prove would be Hilbert's irreducibility theorem. Um, I, I, was, I was half expecting that was what you were going to do to prove existence of S5 extensions, but uh, of course there's a much more concrete way. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that theorem. Uh, I, I mean, th this is this is uh, the the theorem that says generically uh, polynomial with indeterminates remains irreducible over the rationals. Oh. Hmm. What does the proof involve? 
Oh, <laughs> maybe we can talk about it later. Okay. I have a slightly old question, and it was something that you raised. Uh, why has this thing not been done in any theorem prover? Is this just a cultural thing? I was having a rant to Cyril about this recently on email. It seems strange that there's kind of like about, th there's not that many theorems that are not done in any theorem prover on Frake's list. But uh, it does seem like a very strange omission. Well, I know why it hasn't been done in Lean, which is that we just got around, like, Matthew just got to this point. I know that there's a project to do this theorem in MetaMath, but uh, the I haven't heard from the guy who's been working on it in in some time. Um, I mean, we had like the the project last I heard was around where you are. So uh, the I, I mean, it, it it might just be that you know there's several people who are working on it and and no one's got it done yet. I mean, I think it would it would be hard to do this kind of algebra in simple type theory. So, I mean, Isabel or Hall or Hall Light. Um, so, oh, really? Why? Why is that? I don't know. I think of anything with with sort of a sufficient amount of algebra is just kind of kind of hard. Because Cyril I, made it quite clear to me that it was it, it was possible in Cog. A joining field seems kind of messy in a simple type theory. Like if you're trying to iterate over a bunch of, you know, if you define fields as a thing over types, then suddenly if they're simple types, then then you can't start talking about like chains of field extensions. Like that gets really messy. Yeah, actually in, in Coq, we, uh, we flatten the thing uh, very quickly. So when we adjoin things, we consider only the subfield of a given field, which makes everything simpler because we don't have to consider dependent types everywhere. We just have one big type and we work inside the big type. Problems arise when we need to add roots of unity and then we locally add a little bit of a field extension and as soon as possible we put everything in the biggest field extension and we, we start over. But we, so we are almost done actually. We have only uh, two small things to prove and uh, it should be it. Actually, yeah, from that, why not just work in the algebraic closure? <laughs> A algebraic closure, sorry. I think for us, uh, it didn't seem that working the algebraic closure necessarily made anything easier. In Coq, it might be because it's non-constructive. I don't know how much of a big deal that is. Well, the, the algebraic closure of Q exists uh, constructively, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and there are uh, tricks to make classical results available uh, constructively as well. Yeah, so I've been working with um, a lot of field extensions as well. And um, I think one thing really helped is uh, the is scalar tower type class that we uh, have been using. Yes, definitely. Also that was a big to thing Kenny. for us too. Because you can basically slap uh, is scalar tower assumptions over everything, and then all your diagrams commute, which makes. Or you sense. can have a field extension. You can take like a splitting field at the top, and now you have an is scalar tower, and you can still do everything. Yeah. Yeah, actually, there's one funny time where we we used an is scalar tower of e over f or uh, e over bottom over f or e over f over. No, bottom. E over f over bottom. Yeah, e over f over the bottom sub intermediate field of e over f. Um, okay. Right, where the bottom really is just F, if I... Yeah. <laughs> but you, we wanted to transfer, you know, something, the property being a Galois extension from one to the other. Right. I, I wonder if there'll be some sort of analog. Somehow, is scalar tower solves the problem that, that I raised a year or two ago about if you have three rings, A, B, and C, with A a subring of B and B a subring of C, then somehow there's lots and lots of things you want to all be true at once, and you can't formalize it so they are. Yeah, you want B to be an A algebra and C to be an A algebra and C to be a B algebra. But if yeah. some things are types and some things are terms, you're in trouble. And I wonder whether yeah. there's a similar sort of idea lurking in, because you now have 
extensions of groups by groups now, right? When you're doing solvable groups, mm -hmm. you have somehow towers of subgroups. Is there some sort of is scalar tower thing in group mm -hmm. theory that would make that part of the story easier? I don't know. I guess so far, none of the th things we had to prove about solvable groups were hard enough that they seem to need anything like that, but I could easily imagine it would be necessary later. Um, so if I can break in here, we're already way, way over time. I know the session started late, but we're, we're even late beyond that. So maybe it's a, uh, 